there wasn't really, you know, it's hard for us to really determine um, how society played out because there is no concrete written history. However, um, in about the Paleolithic era, we do see some um, some of these, I guess, figurines that were that were found. Um, you know, during archaeological digs, and most of them were of females. And um, as you can see, many of these females were voluptuous and uh, very curvy, which I love. Um, and most of the society that we can think of is was based on matriarchal societies, where a lot of the times, uh, or matrilineal, the only way you could um, kind of decipher family was based through the through the mother because you didn't really have a family unit um it was more of just free love kind of there was and again you know this is all kind of based on just what we've been able to find um and a lot of the figurines that were male identified were much smaller um so it really seemed that the females were being um given a higher status and maybe also have having some goddess um emphasis um so it really looks like as far as the history that the only history or the only proof that we can come off of is the fact of these figurines that were found um although there is some controversy let me get to that about it was it matriarchal versus versus patriarchal um and we you know tend to start with the matriarchal just because of the figurines that were found and um those who have argued about patriarchal society um there really isn't much uh, evidence to provide for that uh so with with that in held it's like we know that women were held in high esteem based on the figurines that were found um also, you know, like I said, there was over 30,000 statues found and 97% of them were women. Um, so you, could, you start to see a lot of that matriarchal um, societal uh, influence in the early days uh, throughout history. But then as time goes on, you start to see this rise in patriarchy. And if you look at, um, if you read Greta Lerner's book, The Creation of Patriarchy, she talks about how this happened. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over, you know, many thousands of years um, in order for this patriarchal society to kind of take place. Um, and so it was, it's, you know, it's been a debate. It's continuing to be a great debate. I was trying to do a lot of research um, again on some of the, the arguments that were back and forth for the both of them and a lot of it is um you know people don't want to believe <laughs> that our society was matriarchal in the, in the beginning and um that's really most of the argument that i can find uh but according to Gerda Lerner the, the patriarchal society began to rise over uh 2500 years between the neolithic era and the archaic era and so what we start to see in the archaic era is this breakdown of hunters and gatherers. Um, so a lot of women who were having to tend to the children um, and feed were stuck kind of to the home base where a lot of men were more of the hunters and gatherers going out and collecting food and collecting fish in some of the societal um, during the archaic era. And you start to see in some of the other, um, more of those, the ones that had a lot of more historical and a lot of more um, so societal tyings together, where the men started to actually rise up and become leaders, uh, taking a lot of, you know, the powers that they had uh, in order to kind of uh, create this system of democracy and laws and they really started to kind of you know take hold of the power that they had and uh, really start to show that and and kind of influence um, other societies that were around them and so more started to kind of branch out with these patriarchal ideas that we're creating laws we're creating systems in place um, so that way the societal will start to form those patriarchal cycles, why, which is why Gerda Lerner was saying it didn't happen overnight. It did happen over thousands of years because it takes time um, for this kind of change to happen. As we know, we've lived in a patriarchal society for many, many years, and um, it's been hard and very difficult for there to be a rise of women coming up as more leaders as we now starting to see more so today. And the reason that this kind of started to happen is because of the way that a lot of um, sexual violence was being played out. Um, we start to see 
some, some forms of protection from rape. Um, the reason because whenever um, women were out by themselves, a lot of times uh, men would rape them for for whatever reasons, they uh, either was war or it was trying to um, find a wife or a bride. Uh, what we know as bride capture is when someone would go um, kind of steal a woman, rape her, and then claim her as, as their own. Um, it took away a lot of their protection. Um, so they didn't want to actually have to broker a deal as opposed to paying a dowry. Um, so when they would rape her, it was pretty much um, the, the woman themselves then became null and void as far as a currency or a commodity. Um, and many times this would happen um, as a, the term marrying up actually came from this uh, type of rape, uh, basically. Uh, so if someone was a lower class or status, they would then go and capture a bride, uh, marry her. And if a woman was of higher status, because of the woman's higher status, uh, the, the family would then um, kind of be in debt to the man who then raped her. So this is nothing new. Uh, it's been here, you know, it's been around for centuries. And as you can see in the picture de uh, depicted below, this is a painting of Kurds, um, which was actually uh, entitled, I believe it was entitled Bride Capture. Um, but it's, it's, it was in the his it's been in history and it's been here ever since. And some e actually U.S. examples could be J.C. Dugard and Elizabeth Smart. Um, they were both uh, captured and kind of taken as their secondary wives and created a family um, with their rapist or the rapist, you know, had to create a family with them. And a lot of the times um, this bride capture, it didn't really matter um, of their well, it did matter of their chastity. So many of times they were they were younger um, as opposed to being an older female um, because they wanted to make sure that they were pure. Um, when we look at the bride price, this was considered a more, I guess you could say, um, acceptable form. Um, women really started to favor the bride price over the bride capture um, because it would, they wouldn't be raped. It would kind of be an agreement. They would kind of have an, a say, not that it would be their determination, but they would have a say as to who it was that they were, um, you know, maybe marrying. Of course, the father was the person, or even the oldest male, if there was no father, was the person um, who actually became um, the broker. And they were the ones who were actually making the deals with each other. And so a lot of times this was based on virginity to determine their worth. So if the, the more that you could prove their virginity, um, the more worth they were. So the younger they are, it was easier to determine virginity. So if they hadn't hit puberty yet, um, it was more likely that they would get a much higher price. Uh, so this is when we really start to see that uh, chastity was being used as um, a form of of worth for women and we still see a lot of that coming out today because we still hear the word slut being used a lot of the time um, and knowing that uh, if you have sex with a lot of people that means you're not as clean or pure and I'm using air quotes you can't see that but I am um, it's I just saw a question about uh, yeah, having to pure uh, I'm mean, having to what was it again it's about um, what method would they use to determine the girl's virginity and how to prove if virginity is still intact? At the time, they did not have the ability to determine virginity. So most of it was based on age, um, even though, cause, because usually if you were younger, uh, then you couldn't um, determine whether or not somebody had their virginity or if somebody had been raped. Um, so a lot of times the younger that they were was less likely to ha they were to have get engaged in sex or to go out on their own and engage in sex, um, which is why a lot of young brides were the ones that were being held or the ones that were uh, getting a lot more of the income for their family or actually having to give to the other man in order to protect her. So this actually 
women were actually more in uh, were wanting to give up their their rights as a human in order to for protection. Um, and although this isn't really the best way to go about it um, at the time, this is what they knew to do and what was most for them. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, back to that question. Um, they didn't have the ability, so it was really just based on age um, that they were able to determine virginity. And if they could keep them in uh, an eye on them uh, and making sure that they were never alone, that's really the only way that they were able to determine someone's virginity or chastity. So we're going on over to the Middle Ages. Like I said, we're going to be going through time really fast. Um, and here during the Middle Ages, we start to see a heavy influence coming from the religion. Um, so you start to see not only is there um, the price or the worth of uh, virginity, but you also start to see this, these religious um, tones, undertones coming in and making sure that uh, it wasn't just about uh, it wasn't just about the um, the price, but it's now about morality. And a lot of times women, because they were becoming more subservient, um, they were told in the Middle Ages to act like a lady. Now, what does that mean? Act like a lady meant, you know, be, be sweet, uh, be quiet, uh, don't speak out of turn. And a lot of times if you did speak out of turn, uh, you would then be disciplined by your spouse or your father uh, because the word family, it's derived from the Latin term familia, meaning the sum of one man's property. And that would include their entire family. And we'll get a little bit more into this when we talk about uh, slavery. I believe it's on the next slide. Um, but a lot of women were disciplined during the Middle Ages. If any of them spoke out of turn, raised any concerns, uh, the term nag was used a lot. Um, so a lot of things in the Middle Ages, when we talk about uh, Back to that question about the chastity, how could you determine someone's virginity? Uh, during the Middle Ages, they had chastity belts in order to protect their virginity. Here's the picture of one chastity belt. Um, as you can see, they tried to make it um, look, I guess, um, pretty with the, the floral designs and the hearts. And you can see if anything entered through the vagina, um, there are those serrated teeth there that could really harm something. Um, and this wasn't just for males that would, it would harm, it would also harm the females. And it also became very difficult for females to have uh, menstruation. It also became very difficult to urinate, uh, to defecate, and a lot of, um, there was a lot of diseases going on and a lot of, it wasn't very clean, cleanliness in order to be able to do that. Yes, they did have locks where they could take it off, but again, uh, who had the key to that? Again, the father is the person who has uh, protection over that. So it's really hard to determine, you know, how easy it was for them to remove these chastity belts. Um, but this also proves that um, women's virginity was held with so it was it was so important to every woman out there and to every man because they were in charge of protecting all the females. Another type of discipline that had occurred was the scolding bridles. Uh, if you see on these scolding bridles, the women would wear these if they were had been nagging or had been talking at a turn or raised their voice. Um, and in in this, there would be a piece that would go into their mouth and you see these three different types of pieces at the bottom of this picture um, that would actually in, be inserted into the mouth. So if the female would move their tongue, it would tear it up um, and it would not allow them to talk. And sometimes men paraded the women around the, the town and men were actually um, applauded for this because that meant they were keeping their family in line. They were, they were disciplining their family in order um, to make sure that their family was intact and seen as um, proper. So a lot of women had to wear these around town and um, was not very nice, I can only imagine. Um, another form of discipline was the dunking stools. This was also used uh, for women who were nagging or talking at a turn. Um, you can see that they would dunk them in the water um, for periods of time where they could not breathe and it, you know, they were practically drowning. Um, uh, this was also used for a lot of the witch trials, uh, but here is one in recent time that uh, it's a picture that, oh my goodness, I, I 
uh, Canterbury, that's what it is, in England. Uh, so this is a dunking stool that is still um, in place, uh, not being used, but it is there in Canterbury, England. Um, so I just wanted to show that how they did it or where they would do it. And it was usually these really long um, poles with a chair on it. And then it was just kind of like a levee where they would just dunk you in and as long as they wanted to and then pull you out um, as another form of discipline. So not happy times. Um, women have had to come through a lot in order to just to live. Um, now, as we go in to America's history, uh, we have a long and sort of history with race with rape, um, and here we start to see a lot of the inner the intersectionality of race and rape occur because this is really the first time that we see um, where we see the um, how race really played an, an integral part, um, and where we see a lot of women actually starting to speak up. Um, when it came to the colonization of America, the rape laws were based mainly on property, as I said, um, in the word, of, in the term of family. Slaves were, were form of property, so they were also included in the sum of one man's property. Um, so many of these times, if a female, a slave female was raped by their owner, there was no law against that. Um, so a lot of the rapes that we do have history on were of white females, um, because if a black man even looked at a white female or even kissed a white female, and even if a white female was the one who was uh, initiating the sexual act, uh, the black man would then be held for rape. However, if a white man raped a black woman, um, there was no laws for that. Um, so you really start to see a lot of uh, the, the slavery, those who were enslaved, not having the ability to even um, have a voice to speak out. Not only did they not have a voice and were they raped by their uh, slave owners, but many of them were used for breeding in order to create more slaves and for them to have more property. So they were also uh, forced to have sex with other slaves. Uh, and usually not their husbands, but the men, the slaves who were the considered the most, the worth the most, which were their bigger ones, uh, the ones who could endure the most pain. So a lot of the times women were raped not only by, um, a, a lot of the slaves were raped not only by the uh, white slave owners, but also they had to endure a lot of sex with black slaves as well. Um, and so you really start to see, uh, you really start to see the the first time, perhaps the very first time that women start to speak out was in the Memphis riot of May in 1866. Um, there were there were some women, some black slaves, who actually were able to testify before Congress about being gang raped um, by a white mob in Memphis. Um, although you know nothing really occurred from that, um, this was the first time that they were able to say that this had happened to them, and this is really kind of the first speak out that uh, women had about the sexual violence that they endured. And a lot of the times when we think about the colonization of America, we also tend to forget a lot of the times the Native Americans that were also kind of obliterated and were um, sexually violated many times over, uh, which you start to see a lot of the, um, the kind of a genocide of their heritage uh, because they were being raped constantly and a lot of um, white uh, the colonizers were coming in and raping some of the women and then also kind of like um, taking a lot of their culture away and making sure that if these are our kids then we're going to keep them and we're going to make sure that you know they're raised this way um, although they were treated still as second-class citizens as we know as uh, the one for the one drop rule where if you have one drop of black you are considered black and therefore you are not of equal as a, as a white man or a white person so um, we did not have a good time and during the colonization of America as far as women go. And you start to see in the Civil War still more rapes going on as um, people were traveling throughout the country during the rapes. I mean, during the war, they were still enduring a lot of the rapes. And that is one topic that I really want to talk about is the, the use of uh, rape as a weapon of war. And um, this has become actually, it, it really just became illegal not too long ago by the United Nations, um, talking about how this is not something that 
there we are no longer allowed to do um but it happens for centuries and thousands of years um and you see in this picture is a statue of a young girl um who was it's it's a statue to symbolize the comfort women during world war ii there were um a lot of uh the japanese army took a lot of chinese uh philippines and just a lot of different women around the area and in, basically enslaved them as um as their own use for sex um sometimes they would be gang raped by um many many soldiers throughout the day uh, many of them were not able to have children um, and they kept them for several years and had several rapes a day um, it could be up to 100 a day. Many of them just felt um, completely uncomfortable. I mean, this is a really, it's a really horrible story and I, I hate to kind of have to think about, but again, we want to honor those um, who did not have a choice and we understand the hardship that they had to go through. It's just a really sad story. And if you ever get a chance to do some more research on comfort, comfort women, I really highly recommend that you do that. Um, but they were enslaved and till, still to this day, there is some tension between the countries, um, particularly China and Korea with um, Japan about this, because a lot of times Japan doesn't want to acknowledge that this even occurred. Many of the comfort women have come out uh, saying, you know, to tell their stories about what happened. And that's why we started to see a lot more of these statues coming forward. There's also a statue in San Francisco, California, uh, in order to honor these women. Um, so ah, that was really difficult for me to talk about, but um, so there's other times where rape has been used as a weapon for war, not just the Civil War or the World War II, but as we see in 1991 through 2000, uh, Sierra Leone had 60,000 women raped. In 1989 through 2003 in Liberia, 40,000 women were raped. 1994 in Rwanda, 100,000 to 250,000 women were raped. Since 1998, Congo, there has been 200,000 and still more. In 1992 through 1995 in Yugoslavia, 60,000. 2004 to the present in Nigeria, 2,000 um, plus raped and 200 plus suicide bombers. These were a lot of the women that were um, kidnapped by the Boko Haram. And there was some, you know, to get our, bring our girls home. Um, some of them are still in captivity. A lot of them had been released. Uh, many of them were also used as suicide bombers. And um, basically there were young girls who were trying to go to school. Um, the, uh, the group there that didn't didn't want didn't believe women should be able to have education. Um, they also wanted to influence their their society by inserting their own uh, genetics into the women, and so that's why many of them were raped so they would have their children. Um, so rape has been used over and over and over again um, throughout history as a weapon for war, um, and it is illegal now and. Many of these countries, you know, are that's why we actually have um, a lot of these um, numbers coming forward because of the United Nations keeping track of all of this. So let's go on to some happier times, right? When change started to occur. Um, and I'm really going to kind of skip over the uh, first wave of the women's movement, which was the suffrage movement and women's right to vote. Um, because this is the second wave is really when we start to see the sexual violence um, uh, movement coming forward. And so we start to see a lot of influence uh, coming from the civil rights. And so what happened um, was we start to see, you know, all of these groups coming together to fight the civil rights uh, era. And we start to see the Students uh, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, um, making a big statement with civil rights. And they also joined in with uh, the Selma March. Uh, Stokely Carmichael uh, was really important during this time as well as, um, oh my goodness, I just forgot his name. He is the, um, he's the, a senator now. Um, I cannot think of his name, but I love him. And I can't believe I can't remember his name right now. Anyways, they were the two most important people at Georgia. Is yes, 
Yes. Um, hold on a second. I'll think of his name. Just wanted to clarify. Okay. That would help me so much because it's going to just drive me nuts. Um, and so you start to see a lot of women who are really doing a lot of the groundwork for the organizing. John Lewis, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so you start to see women doing a lot of the groundwork when it came to doing these organizations in the sit-ins. The women were very, they were there right next to them, but you really saw the men um, being the face of the movement. Um, all of the women were doing a lot of work behind the scenes. And what they started to notice was that their voices weren't being heard as much. Um, and so they did a position paper in 1964 by Mary King and Casey Hayden, um, kind of talking about their grievances that they were having during the civil rights movement, where they weren't getting a lot of um, their own voices heard. And what they started to notice was that, yes, we are oppressed, oppressed as, uh, you know, trying to fight for civil rights, people, we know people who are black are being oppressed, but we as women, even within the civil rights, are starting to be oppressed. Um, Stoke, Stokely Carmichael was listening to all of this kind of happen, and he was, you know, kind of getting, I don't know if it was tongue in cheek, I'm not quite sure how he really wanted to say this, uh, but his comment is still the same. The only position for women in the SNCC is prone. Um, and you know, to put that in real word terms is uh, the only place for women in the SNCC is on their backs. Uh, so you can take that however you want to take it. Uh, but a little women were outraged by this and they just started, they started to look at their own oppression um, and started to really talk about it with other people about how they were feeling oppressed during the civil rights movement. Um, so they really started to organize and create these conscious consciousness raising group, rising groups. Um, so a lot of the women started to say, you know what, we're being oppressed, let's get together, let's find out what's going on with each other, how are you being treated, how am I being treated, and actually I kind of see a lot of this happening uh, today uh, with the Harvey Weinstein and um, what's going on in Hollywood, a lot of women are actually now starting to come together to say, you know, I was, I know I've been treated this way, other women have been treated this way and we're no longer gonna sit down and take it. We're now gonna start and rise and start to do something about it. Um, so they really wanted to talk about the, the grievances that women were experiencing because nobody had ever given them the opportunity to kind of voice their opinion. Um, so they wanted to now be able to take charge of their own oppression and start to say, this is what was happening to us and we wanna make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, so, the second wave is really where we start to see the anti-rape movement coming forward. Um, in 1971, the first Take Back the Night was done in New York City. Um, and it was, it was very brave of these women to really come forward um, and speak out about the rape that they had endured. And what we start to see is that survivors became activists. Um, we started to see a lot of them say, you know what, it, it's important that people hear our voices, but now we need to change what's happening. We don't want this to happen to anybody else. And so this movement was really started by survivors uh, who wanted to, to, to make a change, who wanted to say, this happened to me, I don't want it to happen to anybody else, what can we do? And in 1972, Washington, D.C. inspired the first race crisis hotline, which we now have as RAIN, um, and then we started to see rape crisis centers just pop out during the 70s all around the country, and um, many women were actually starting to receive services that they had never received before. Of course, it was few and far in between. Um, you know, many of it was only in larger cities. None of the rural areas were actually receiving any help, um, or they would have to travel very far in order to get and receive help, um, but it actually... Um, it started our movement and it became, we started be having a voice and we started became, we started to become something that people started to recognize more and more, even though nobody still wanted to talk about it. Uh, and when we looked at, uh, when we looked at prevention that was going on during this time, much of the prevention that was being used was based on, um, on safety. So it was a lot of self-preservation, a lot of um, risk reduction. How do you uh, keep yourself from being safe? So we started to see a lot of people talking about, you know, watch your drink and making sure that you carry a weapon and don't be out late and make sure that you're with somebody else. Um, and we started to see a lot of that prevention coming out during those early years. 
um, because we really just wanted to keep people safe as much as possible. Um, of course, we now know what that kind of prevention has done in kind of creating victim blaming, and now we're now moving uh, away from that, which I'll talk about a little bit in a little bit. But um, at the early times when we first started prevention, it was the only prevention we had known. It was what we were doing at the time in order to keep our bodies safe. Uh, and then you start to see in 1994, the Violence Against Women Act passed. Uh, Senator Joe Biden at the time was uh, one, of the, one of the authors on that. Uh, and he's also done a lot of work since then. And in 2013, we saw the reauthorization of VAWA. And this in, was kind of a huge reauthorization because it had been reauthorized several times uh, before 2013. But in 2013, we actually included Native Americans, gay, lesbian, and transgender survivors, which was a huge step uh, in including a lot and being more inclusive um, and also males as well. So this is really the 70s through the 90s um, was really a time when we start to see the movement take force. And so now I'm getting more into where we're at today. Um, where are we in this line of what do we need to focus on? Where are we at? So we know that as far as prevention goes, that it was it wasn't done as well as we would have liked to have it done in the in the beginning where we focus on safety. So now we're moving more towards primary prevention to take the onus off of the victims and put it back on the perpetrators and looking about how can we influence those who actually are capable of rape, how do we keep them from raping as opposed to how do we keep victims from becoming victims. Uh, so this has taken us in a whole new movement, in a whole new way, and I think, you know, we'll start to see, we're starting to see some of the effects, I believe, uh, come about when we talk about um, hypermasculinity or we talk about bystander intervention. So we're starting to see some changes happening. It's going to take a long time before we really start to see the effects of it. And one way, because I used to do prevention, um, to think about it is planting seeds. We're really planting seeds. and we're creating a culture where we can start to cultivate those seeds in order to grow. Um, so we're hoping that this is going to create the environment that we hope for in the future. And right now, as it comes to advocacy, we know our movement is survivor centered. Uh, we want to keep it survivor centered as much as possible. And we want to to make sure that we're trauma informed um, so that way we're not uh, re-traumatizing survivors we want to make sure that we're doing what's best for them um, and a lot of times we have to fight that system when we're trying to work with law enforcement who are not survivor centered most of the time there are few and far between law enforcement agencies that are coming forward to take more of a survivor centered approach um, however um, it is not the, the law of the land as far as the rest of the country is concerned um, we're also looking at a more intersectional approach to oppression, and we're not just fighting sexual violence because we want to end all forms of oppression because it's not just one factor that's going to affect us. As a woman of color, it's not just the sexual violence that affects me. There are multiple things that affect me, and we want to make sure that uh, women are not receiving violence at all or that survivors of sexual violence, including men, are not receiving, um, are not getting are not being held under oppression. And so now there has become this kind of internalized battle when it comes to how we're, um, how we're working within our agencies. Um, it's this kind of how do we balance um, being survivor centered with needing the resources or to put it bluntly, the money. Um, we need money, and a lot of the times that those come from governmental grants, right? It's easy to, to, to get money from governmental grants than it is to kind of go out searching for uh, any other kind of fund funding, and whether it be donations. And um, when it comes to the need for resources, and we have to start putting our um, a lot of our services into paperwork and making sure that we have, the, you know, a number of, of support groups or the number of clients that we serve as opposed to how are we serving those survivors um, we're kind of in this I, I was speaking with one of our one of my colleagues who was you know we were talking about um, 
where do we put our focus because we still need the resources, but at the same time, um, we have to worry about the quality of the work that we're providing. And we have so many new advocates entering every single day. Um, we're, we're putting them through training and we're doing it quickly because we need the people on the ground, but then how well are they trained? Are we, do we need to standardize training assessment? Um, and it's really hard to find that balance with uh, the need for resources, the need for more money, and then being able to stay true to our grassroots movement. Um, it becomes this kind of internalized battle between every advocate and preventionist as it is with every agency as well. Um, but what's possible is that we are living history right now. I have just spent the last, what, 40 minutes going through years and years and years of history of what have people have done. We are our leaders now. We have the ability to make sure that what we do is going to take effect and is going to make a difference for our children. So I love, you know, And Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. Um, and that's what we're still doing. We, we're still rising. We're not done. We're not, we haven't reached our peak yet. Uh, so we are living history right now and we can continue to make changes. Um, this is something that, you know, I love to do. I love to make sure that any little thing that I do, anything that I say is, is sparking some kind of hope for the future. Yes, we've had a horrible history. It's been rough. It's been tough. But we're making change. We've had, we've done so much uh, from the second wave movement till now, but we still have so much further to go. Um, we have youth that are coming in who we don't want to see having to fight the same battles that we've had to fight for. And there are new struggles coming every single day. Um, with the current administration, we're fighting um, some of the same battles we fought before and having to fight for them again. Um, we know, you know, campus uh, sexual assault, how it's being um, kind of rescinded after Betsy DeVos rescinded the, the Dear Colleague letter and what kind of strain that puts on us but we can still rise. Um, so here's you know, how, our, how, how do we continue our work with everything that we have experienced, everything that we know, uh, we need to continue to honor uh, where we came from, but we need to embrace the future and those coming in. And it's hard to bridge that gap because uh, things change so quickly nowadays, especially with the internet and the access to information. It becomes really difficult for us to kind of keep up, but that's why we need so many more people um, into the world. So what we need to do now is, you know, this is a topic for conversation. What do we need to do now? I mean, the struggles definitely continue. Do we need to be continue to we need to continue to push back on governmental directives that are not in line with our values? Um, you know, Democrat, Republican, whatever it is, if it's against sexual violence, then we need to make sure that we're fighting those because we want to keep our survivors centered. Um, we need to continue to increase awareness and advocacy for those at the intersections. There are still many people falling between the cracks, and either we're not doing enough outreach or we're not. Um, we're not opening our doors up enough, but we need to make sure that people know that we're available for everyone to be able to um, get services from. And we need to continue to invite more people into the conversation. Um, one thing that I have found difficulty with is getting um, support for helping men come into the movement. I know as Texas has done, Texas has done a great job as far as uh, engaging men into the conversations. I found others, other parts of the country that have not been as successful as far as wanting to include men into the conversation, and that needs to change. Um, we cannot do this work without men uh, because this is all of our responsibility. It's men's responsibility. Um, and without them, we can't change the way that men treat women and we can't change the way that women interact with men. Uh, we need to continue to invest in healing um, and divest from criminal justice-based solutions. A lot of the times, uh, that's really the only recourse we have for some kind of sense of justice. And although it may be useful for many survivors, many survivors don't even get criminal justice uh, resolution. And we need to look out for other ways for our survivors to be able to get resolution um, without having to depend on the, on the criminal justice system, whatever that may look at. That may just be 
uh, women being able to tell, you know, have a platform to say, this happened to me and it shouldn't happen anymore. Or if it's whether to have a conversation with someone who has, who has, a, who has a history of sexual, of sexually abusing others or raping others and being able to say, this is how it affects me. You need to understand that. Um, so some kind of reformative justice or restorative justice um, would be, you know, ways to kind of look at in the future. We also need to continue to sustain our staff and our expertise in our movement. We've come a long way as far as making um, the anti-sexual violence uh, movement be known, um, be a force, and we need to continue to do that. We need to continue to make sure that survivors who are in the movement, that they feel safe continuing their fight. Uh, they started this movement, and we need to continue to support our survivors that are in, that are here. We also uh, need to continue to get our education. Um, you know, there are a lot of different um, other social issues out there that have uh, some kind of degree program that is associated, whether it be chemical dependency or whether it be um, criminal justice. What about, you know, our movement having the exact same set of expertise that is expected for those of us who are going to be working with such, for so many people who have been affected by trauma? And we really, really need to start working towards liberation for all, um, and that's at all, at all forms of oppression, not just um, sexual violence. If we need to be more inclusive, we need to continue the fight with everyone involved. And um, unfortunately, you know, we still have a way to go. Um, but I, I do have faith in our movement. I have. I have faith in a lot of my colleagues that I've come to know over the years, and I know that we are a strong bunch, men and women together, um, and that we're gonna we're gonna continue to fight, um, especially you know with all the struggles that we have facing us. I don't see a sense of backing down from anyone that I have talked to, um, so that gives me hope for the future. Um, so I just want to you know throw it out there for questions. Um, I know I went through that really fast. It's really hard to talk about history without kind of going off track. So I wanted to make sure that every, that we try to co cover as much as possible. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free. Okay, there is a question here, and it's for Tassa from Sarah, who says, has Tassa been collecting a list of other forms for actions beside interacting with the criminal justice system or the civil court system? And I've got to be really truthful in telling you that I'm not exactly clear. I know that we keep, a, we do collect a lot of information, and I don't know where it's being stored or what we're doing with it, but thank you for the question, Sarah. I'm going to look into it, and I'm going to get back with you on that. Okay. Annette, we had another question, and the question was basically, where did you get your pictures from? They were awesome, especially the <laughs> ones that started, uh, you know, when you started the presentation about prehistoric times. And I said I thought you got it from... Um, uh, Karen Wilson's book, but I'm not totally clear or sure about that. Yeah, no, I mean, the information, a lot of the information did come from Karen Wilson's um, book, but not the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, the pictures, I really went on a on a goose hunt <laughs> looking okay. for a lot of these things, so it was kind of difficult. I wanted to make sure that I got pictures that depicted exactly what I was trying to convey. Uh, I'm a very visual learner, so pictures are huge for me. Um, so that was, it was really just Google. <laughs> Google is my best friend. So yeah, these pictures are definitely available online. And that sounds um, awesome. Yeah. Because I remember taking a class way back when in like prehistoric art. And I saw some of those pictures then. And I'm like, whoa, but I never really made the connections. So thank you for doing that. Helping me make the connections. Okay. All right. Is there anything else that anybody wants to ask? Well, we're just hanging here. <laughs> okay. I also want to make the point that Annette had a fantastic mentor in Dr. Wilson. 
Um, so I just want to tag on there that by default, I also get some credit because Dr. Wilson was also my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. She's amazing. I, I miss her every day. Yes. Will there be a, the participant certification comes in the follow-up email that y'all will receive an hour after we close this down. I'm going to put up the pre-test, I mean the post-test in a minute. And um, I, I just thank you, Annette, so much for being willing to do this. And um, you all will receive a pow the PowerPoint presentation, and Annette has all the answers to your questions. I'm not the person this time who will do that. The PowerPoint will also come in the pow in the follow up email that you will receive a little after an hour after I close this down. Yeah, training new officers. You're welcome. Annette, you did an amazing job. Okay, I'm going to put up the um, next test, which is the post test. And if you can please take that, that would be awesome. Annette, I'm going to mute me. I'm going to mute you. And I will talk with you later on this afternoon. Again, thank you so much. I want you all to know that she got up extra early because she's out on the West Coast doing the <laughs> presentation. So I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Annette. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.